What's up, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of the Blue Jay Center podcast, brought to you by the, the Sick Podcast Network. I'm uh, here with all, uh, I'm James Price, along with my buddy Rob. We're here again, and some positive vibes to talk about during this one. Let's get this thing started. Turn up your volume, because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast, Blue Jays Center. Bautista drives it deep. The sickest Toronto Blue Jays podcast. It's going to be sick. Boy, Rob, it has been a weird last little bit. I mean, we had, oh, well, we're not going to, we're not going to say it just yet, but the first thing we're going to touch on was kind of the, the weirdest thing I've seen in a while. Um, you got a couple wins today and yesterday that we'll touch on briefly, but uh, let's not, I'm not going to beat around the bush anymore. Ross Atkins. We heard before, uh, you know, the, the day prior that Ross Atkins, 1045, media availability, and we're all like, ooh, yeah. what's he going to say? But I think you and I, we're both sitting here like, you're going to get nothing. Dude's a right. robot. And Rob, I'm going to ask you, bud, what'd you get out of that riveting Ross Atkins media availability? First of all, let me just say, I hope everyone had a terrific holiday. We got a couple of Blue Jays wins, some nice, neat and tidy stuff there. All the positive vibes, you know, they've, they've come out of premium for this team this season. So I want to put that out there. Nice to have a couple of wins. Let's Except see if we get a series win. But yes, go on. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I bet when Ross Atkins talks, I mean, yeah, he's 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 a stiff with a face. Let's be honest. <laughs> like you, you just hear that he's going to talk and, you know, it's going to be full on chat GPT word salad. It's going to be nothing redeemable. It's going to be a waste of everyone's time. It's honestly just a, a pulse check just to make sure everyone's still breathing. That's to me, that's what I get when a Ross Atkins availability. And honestly, here's the thing, people. I think Ross Atkins is a little tone deaf. I think he's awful at communicating with the fan base. No one likes this lawyer uh, business type BS that he spews out. But the reality is, I think what people have to understand is that regardless of what you feel about a team on May 19th or 18th or whenever that day was, Nothing's changing, you know, no, whether you're a seller, whether you're a buyer, n- nothing's changed the, d- the direction of that team. And obviously the Blue Jays struggling immensely. The fan base is fed up. They've completely uh, floundered expectations to the point where now they're very unlikely to make the playoffs, according to many models. Mm-hmm. So obviously fans are frustrated and Ross Atkins going to the podium. You knew that regardless of what was going to happen, fans were going to be displeased with it because sure. one, Atkins doesn't really give you much anyway to begin with. And two, the, the context was just bad. I mean, it was just a, a, a low vibe because the Blue Jays were coming off another series loss to the Rays uh, officially. And yeah, I, 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 I took nothing out of it. I, don't, I think that we're no less educated or more educated on this team than we were 24 hours before the availability, 24 minutes prior to the availability. It, to me, it was a whole lot of nothing. That's why I'm just so curious as to why it even happened. Like it was so right. out of the blue. You just see it on Twitter. Uh, Twitter. What? Twitter. Uh, Keegan Matthew X- firing up. No, no, Twitter. Uh, Ten forty-five a.m. the next day, and it's like, what? Are, like, what, what? Like, what? What's this guy gonna tell me? That's gonna make me feel better about this team. And you got nothing. The only thing that I got out of that, and God, it was me maybe trying to grab at the smallest of things. It was Buck Martinez asked the question, and he was basically like, you know, with this core, there's been no winning. So you know, where is the end of this core? And it didn't take Ross very long to like snap back and say, we're not there yet. And so that kind of told me that it's a little bit of a sensitive topic. Um, What that means, (laughs) your guess is as good as mine, but that's really the only sort of not robot lawyer-esque answer that I got uh, out of that whole thing. And it, it showed me a little bit, but not enough to care. No, no. And, and like, really, like, there was, there's nothing that was going to change your perception as a fan. Like, we all no. know as fans, we, we all know what this team needs to do. That's obviously, a, there's nothing they can do with from now until the next couple mm-hmm. months. You got to play your best baseball, put your best foot out there and see what happens. But ultimately, where they will be in two months will determine what they should do. You know, if they're still floundering and still out of a playoff spot like they are now, their playoff probabilities still in the 20s, which is what they are right now, After even after today's win, uh, then, yeah, then you, you have to consider a point where you have to do either a soft reset and scale back, which is the most likely outcome, or scale back even further and start per- perhaps looking out for a, a, a new window beginning somewhere in the future. Or, obviously, if it goes the other way, the way that we haven't had any 
reason to believe will go. They rip off a ton of wins, and they're in a position where they're going for a, a third straight playoff appearance, which at this point we would all love to see. We it's it's hard to envision considering how awful the product has been, but it's still on the table. And Ross Atkins, the guy who constructed this team, and the guy who I mean, let's be honest, all signs on the wall point to him being the first one out. Should this team continue to this this uh to to fall below expectations, yeah. I think it's his job to hold firm and not be emotional one way or another. Uh, I, I think that as fans, we, we we don't like to hear that. As fans, we, we, we don't like the, like the logical approach. We all really much care about this team, even though we are objective when it comes to covering them. We want to hear answers. We want to hear right now, why is this team scoring fewer runs than anyone but the White Sox? Unfortunately, they're playing right now. Why is the bullpen so bad? Why is just the vibes are so terrible? FP fans want to know that. And unfortunately... Uh, Ross Atkins is just not going to go out there and spill the whole secrets in a, a 10:45 Sunday press conference. Unfortunately, but yeah, I agree. It, this, not, I, I would be surprised if anyone actually took anything of value from that. Yeah, there is really nothing to it, and that's why I'm so. I mean, we'll never know, but I'm very curious because you damn well know that Ross Atkins wasn't the guy that's like, Mark John, I'm going to go talk to the media tomorrow. You de he definitely that definitely did not happen. <laughs> It must have come from Mark or maybe even higher up. I don't know. But, like, yeah. you know you're giving the fan base nothing. And that's – I'm, yeah. I'm going to flip it to hockey for a second. That's why Leaf fans love Craig Berube right now because he's going to tell you like it is. He doesn't give a crap yeah. what you think. And when, meanwhile, yeah. we're we're watching Robot Central with uh, with with yeah. Ross Atkins trying to do any sort of media. It's, it's a painful watch. Um, and he just looks like he just doesn't want to be there at, at all times, especially that one. He looked like, yeah, I'm checked out. I don't want to be here. It looked like oh. he didn't think there was going to be many, many guys. Well, with, with, with the way this season's going, though, he might, he oh, might yeah. not get a choice whether he wants to be here or not when it comes yeah, to the season's well, end. Let's be honest. That's the question, you know. Mo, and I asked Mo last week was like, "Do you want Ross making these moves? Like, that's the that's a big question. Do you want like we're talking about Bo and Vlad making those big cho big choices? Do you want Ross making that? No, probably not because he won't see the end product of whatever happens. Yeah. So. That's yeah. an interesting t tidbit from that. So I don't know if this Ross Atkins thing was supposed to maybe turn the temperature down on himself. If, but it didn't. Me, it feels like, you know how people say the NFL is, is a foolproof product and regardless of what they do, it won't matter because people will still watch and they'll still gain a ton of revenue. I yeah. feel like that's kind of the opposite with when it comes to Blue Jays fans. Whereas, uh, I mean, obviously this can change if the Blue Jays start winning. Maybe that changes a bit. But I, I think at this point with the way the pulse of the fan base feels towards Ross Atkins. There's almost <laughs> nothing he can say that will change the, the negative tune on him right now. And, and honestly, I, I don't think that that's completely unmerited. No, it's, it's uh, look, the only way that his name gets talked about in a good light is if something happens in October. Uh, that's it. Right. Why did the Jays love Anthopolis? They gave us, he gave us those two years of playoff games. If, if they, if they, in 2015, if all those trades fell apart and you, you didn't make the playoffs that year. No one will be talking about uh, Anthopolis the way they do okay. now. But we all, I mean, the, the hardcore fans know what, what majority of uh, Anthopolis moves actually did. Uh, not very much. Not very much. That was oh, the no, desperate, no, I'm trying right. to save my job and look for my next job type of move uh, in 2015. Um, and for, for, for Ross, like, I don't want him making those types of moves because this team's not exactly. that team. They're not that product. So and, and you have to think just logically if, if yeah. he's not going to be here, which right now, I mean, like the, to me, there's no reason why Ross Atkins should be here after this season. No. If the team that misses the playoffs, like at this point, based on all the data we've received from what that's now a 46 game sample, all the data suggests this is not a playoff team. Like this is yeah. not 2021. If you remember a couple of years ago where the record wasn't great, but at the same time, Hey, you were only a couple games out of a playoff. So look at all the underlying metrics. Look at how good this team actually is. They're yeah. just missing that little bit. No, like the, the, all the data suggests that this team is maybe not fortunate, but they, they, they're they merited. They're 21 and 25 record, three games out of a playoff spot, blasting the American League East. Like they, that's deserved considering yeah. the performance they put up there. So it's even the, really Rob, even the, even the eye yeah. test suggests that. So yeah, that, that absolutely. Well. Oh, the eye test. It's, it's the worst because even yeah. last year, like the eye test, objectively wasn't great but at least they yeah. came with winning games in a playoff spot like right now it's looking to the point like this core has exhausted all the winning they can they're not very flexible we'll talk about like the roster composition later yeah. but it looks like they might have exhausted the core that so far has only produced two playoff appearances and no playoff wins unfortunately that that's yeah. what ross atkins legacy right now with the core that he built now 
speaking of core and core that they built, uh, a big piece of that a couple of years back in 2022 was Alec Manoa, man. I mean, that guy, we all know, right? His first two years in the league, dude was a dog. I mean, I got his jersey on right now because he is a dog on the mound. But everybody knows it's well documented. The last year, complete just debacle of a season for him. And this year, not being healthy. And then his first start didn't go great. And then he was getting teed off on by, by A ball players last year. His last two starts, more in particular yesterday against the Rays. Yeah. Boy, that's the best we've seen Alec Manoa throw in quite some time. Then what question I got for you, Rob? Is Alec Manoa yeah. back? Is he back? Uh, is he back? I mean, I don't know if I have the balls to make that kind of a declaration. I do have the balls to say he's looked way better in his last two starts than he did at any point last season. Through any stretch of time of significant innings. And not to mention that you mentioned two back-to-back -back starts. I think the most important thing is that you look at who they played they played like two very legitimate big league lineups you know they have the yep. minnesota twins team that has hit really well against the right-handed pitching all season long and we all know the tampa bay rays how good they are at gathering data and pitching to your weaknesses even though alec manoa has historically done very well against the rays mm -hmm. uh to, to go up there seven back-to-back -back outings with seven innings zero earned runs that's a huge huge step the slider looks legit i mean that was the biggest issue last year was his slider was uncompetitive. Like he was getting no swing and misses. It was like, it, it was not tricking any hitters. It was basically a useless pitch. And that was for him, a guy who doesn't throw upper nineties, a guy who sits at 94, 95, he's going to need that slider. That slider was a big reason why he was so effective at the beginning of his career back in 21 and then 22. And the fact that we've seen it uh, look so good as it's looked so far, I think that's, I think that's very encouraging a uh, fastball, it, it's where it's always been 94 95 with good command, mm -hmm. which is you know, the commands have been in and out, but so far it's been really good at the big league level, uh, surprisingly well, in my opinion. And uh, the changeup, which I, I didn't think was quite as good yesterday as it was in the Minnesota start, but I think the fact that he's throwing that pitch and he got some good results on that, I mean, you're talking about the ingredients of a legitimate back end of the rotation guy. Remember, coming into the season, we didn't need Alec Manoa to be Alec Manoa of 2022, we needed him to just be a good big league starter. However, knowing how bad the Blue Jays are when it comes to scoring runs, in order to win games, they might have to do it with elite pitching like they did last season. So to have a, a legitimate fifth starter who had the ceiling of a Cy Young finalist, obviously I'm not saying that Alcmano is going to be a Cy Young finalist again this season. It's only a couple starts. But if he can be a good pitcher, all of a sudden, yeah, no, this this rotation, which we already feel very good about, takes, takes a higher ceiling. Much yeah. higher ceiling now because you've gotten really nothing out of your fifth starter slot. I mean, Yariel Rodriguez was all right for a stretch, but between that, you had the Bowden Francis experiment experience, and then the having the no depth. Like, yeah, no, it's it's been massive. And this, I've said it so many times, we've needed a good story. And Alec Manoa, guy who the fan base loves, they adored those couple years when he was pitching really well, pitches with all that swagger. Even yesterday, you saw him getting hyped up on the mound. You just love to see that as a fan. So uh, I'm welcome. I'm, I welcome Alec Manoa to be back, and hopefully. Yeah, he can build off these last couple of good outings. Yeah, a couple of a couple of things I wanted to build off of that. Uh, you mentioned the changeup that he was using more. Um, they showed the arsenal yesterday, and, and like how many pitches he threw—one hundred and three pitches yesterday—and it was almost like split, like thirty pitches, thirty pitches, thirty pitches, and like twenty pitches or something. It was it was incredible the how much he of his pitches, and he was throwing straight. Yeah. Like that that game was the most stereotypical Alec Manoa start you can get without a few more base runners because he loves to get a little, get into a little trouble and then find a way to get out of it. He allowed one hit, one, single. one walk, but he hit well, two one guys. ground ball single, but he yeah. hit two guys. Yeah. I mean, that's the Alec Manoa, especially you hit a couple of guys, but the rest of the time, your command is on point. As you mentioned, the one hit was a ground ball up the middle by, was it Rotovere, the catcher? Yeah, like it, yeah, was, ben it was, it was, it was, it Yeah. It was awesome. He was absolutely electric. And you mentioned the emotion. Look, I said it, I think I said, I can't remember what I said during that interview, the BJC interview. If people haven't checked that out, we had a chat with Alec Manoa. God, how long ago was that? Oh, I think over three years ago. That was before his debut. Yeah. It was, it was that, it was that spring training when him and Simeon's Woods Richardson were kind of yeah. like teeing off on things. The COVID, the COVID spring training. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I can't remember where I was going with this. Oh, I was telling my like Roger Center, man, you, you give us something to be hype about and he gives the emotion. Toronto fans will love you to death. They absolutely oh, will. And that emotion you were talking about yesterday. I mean, who who wasn't hyped after seeing him oh, strike yeah. out the final guy the seventh inning and knowing his day was done, but getting jacked up? It's incredible. It's great stuff. That was huge because I, I remember in the Minnesota start, and obviously 
after he goes six strong against Minnesota, it was still a zero zero game at that point. Yeah. And my whole line of thinking was the when I saw him come out for the seventh, I, I get that your bullpen, you don't trust him, but I really did feel like you needed him to finish on a high note. Uh, when you give up the home run to Santana, there obviously it was an unearned run. Ernie Clement makes the error with two outs, so uh, yeah, it, none, of, none of the runs went to him. But it, it was just it, it left a bittersweet taste in your mouth because you just thought of how good this day could have finished if Manoa goes uh, scoreless and the Blue Jays come back and win. Unfortunately, uh, Clement gave them an extra out and Carlos Santana takes advantage. The Jays lose, and uh, it was huge. Back in that same situation, literally yesterday, six strong innings. Now you have a bit of a lead, you have a bit of a cushion, and he goes up there, puts up a zero in the seventh, seventh scoreless innings. That was massive. Massive for his confidence. It's just massive for us as, as fans because w- w- Alec Manoa, we need Alec Manoa to be good. Like The Blue Jays yep. absolutely need. They the do. amount of starting pitching that this team has, that this organization has been unable to develop. I mean, you, look at all the guys. I mean, we talked about Nate Pearson, and now Ricky Tiedemann's injured. I mean, Alec Manoa has really been the only staple, the only guy that they've been able to homegrown and turn into a legitimate guy. And you have a guy with multiple years of control now. For a team that is going to need young, controllable pieces moving forward, if they, should they go into a rebuild, you kind of need a guy who has the kind of upside that Alec Manoa has to pitch well for you. And the fact that we're seeing him do it at the big league level now, yeah, mm-hmm. no, it's it's huge. It, it, and it's all command. Like, like yeah. I mean, you look at all these minor league starts that he had when things weren't going well, five walks, right? And he's just plunking three guys. I mean, God, his first spring training start this year, right? Didn't he plunk exactly. the first, well, like the first guy? Yeah. or he, it, it was an ugly, ugly first start. Yeah. And now he went seven shutout innings of two base, or I guess technically four base runners against the, uh, against the Rays. And one guy put the ball in play. And gone on base. Like <laughs> it's baseball, really man. No it's so balls. crazy. Really, no hard hit balls either. No, it's not like no, no, a lot yeah. of like, you know, like out like hard hit luck. You know what I mean? So yeah, he was absolutely yeah. electric. Uh, and I'm really excited. What's it? When's his next start? I think it's Friday against Detroit. So it'd it? be Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it's Friday. Which actually, e- e- even last year, you remember last year that he he came up against Detroit and he actually pitched well against them. One of the only few good starts he had all of last year. So hopefully, he has another good start in Detroit. The, the, the only good starts I remember from the from last season was that one. Then the Boston series, he pitched a great game at Fenway, I believe it was. I I, um, I remember he, early in the year too at, at Yankee Stadium, he went toe to toe with Garrett Cole and matched and pitched for pitch. The Jays ended up losing, I believe, in extra innings or something like that. But I remember he pitched really well that game too. So that that, that was the, there. There were a few. <laughs> there were a few. He's already put up a, a couple this year though, so that that's good that he's uh, he's getting already to that level. It's a good sign moving forward. Now, from the from the, I guess we're sticking with the positive stuff. Rob, how many times have we been on here, okay, with Cole or it's Mo or I guess with with Cole it was Mo and Luis one time, and we're all talking about the lineup and we're all yelling at John or whoever the hell is making this damn lineup and talking about George Springer in the leadoff hole. Yep. Not only has that changed, but today. Danny Jansen's hit in second, and boy, did that pay off for them. Drove in five. And Bo Bichette got hot today. I mean, against the White Sox, I know, but three extra base hits, three doubles. Sure, That's what Bo's sure doing it's. his thing. Dalton Barsha in the spot he should be in the seven hole. It, two, yeah. two for four, hit a bomb. Like, it's good vibes. I, go, I get it's the White Sox, but these guys are playing where they should be. And isn't it a beautiful thing? You play your best players in the most opportune opportunity. Opportune opportunity. Whatever you guys know what I mean, yeah, yeah, there, sure. Um, and so you know, it's great with the lineup shakeup that this team has put together. It has finally happened that every Jace fan has talked about the Schneider leading off, Jansen's hit in seventh. The one thing I scratched my head today is why Daniel Vogelback didn't play, and you'll touch on Justin Turner in a bit, but why yeah. Bogey didn't play after his great game yesterday, and you have a lefty crochet going tomorrow. So I don't really understand why he didn't play today, but other than that. I mean, I, I'm enjoying it. It's fun because Vladdy's getting hot. I mean, as you as you pointed out in the chat, he's the Luis Rise 2.0, getting the base hits and the walks. Like, that seems to be him. <laughs> oh, had the three doubles, right? He had, what, I think uh, the one hit uh, Schneider had today was a double. Jansen double, had yeah, a double on the line. Yep. Yeah, double and a home run today for Janie Jansen. Five, five RBIs? Five, how many RBIs? Yeah, five ribs. Yeah, five, yeah, five, five ribs. Yeah. Yeah. And Springer's yeah. in the six hole. Where he should yep. be, Rob. What are you feeling like right. with this new lineup? No, uh, it's for sure. We've all talked about how this lineup needs a shakeup, not because, well, well, just factually, like you just want like guys like hitting like wherever. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, there is strategic consequences to, to the lineup. Your best hitters are going to get the most looks at the top of the. Well, I shouldn't say your best hitters. Your top hitters 
are going to get the most at bats. It's it's basic math. Like if you, if you hit one, you're gonna get more at bats. The guy hitting two, the guy hitting three. We we don't have to go through all that. But we we understand yeah. that. So when you had a guy like George Springer hitting as bad as he was in that number one spot, you're hamstringing your lineup. Here is a secret, not really a secret, but I, I don't think something that a lot of baseball fans understand is that we talk about high leverage innings, seventh inning, eighth inning, ninth inning, clutch situations. What people don't understand is that the first inning of the ball game is the most important inning. Because it's the only inning where you can control who's hitting for you. It's the only inning where you can control what three guys you want to set up to the box. If you look at team OPSs for all the teams in baseball, maybe there's an outlier. I don't know. I haven't checked the numbers in a while. The highest OPSs are in the first inning. And it's, it makes sense. You have, you have your top of your hitters, your best hitters. You have your pitcher that you're facing is uh, probably not all, all loosened up yet. It's his first time starting. So... It's very important for the Blue Jays to jump out on teams, especially considering we all know how bad they are when they fall behind early. And oh, to me, yeah. I, I just feel like the fact that you were not punting away an inning, but like really hamstring your ability to score and get up early in the first inning by sending a bad hitter. Let's be honest, George Hitter's been a bad hitter this season. Yeah. Uh, hitting cleanup, well, not cleanup, hitting leadoff every single game. Uh, to me, that, that was just very poor strategic management. And I understand there was politics behind of it. You have your highest paid player. You want to protect his ego. I get it. But at the same time, look, Ross Atkins, George Springer's going to have a job next year. He's going to get paid 25 bones regardless of where he's hitting. You're going to get fired if this team loses. So you, you are the one asked to make the call. You're the one asked to make the call. Look, George, I get that your ego might be a little hurt and you might pout a bit. But at the same time, this team needs to win games or else I'm out of a job. You know, yeah. so thank God. I'm Whoever made the call, whether it was John, whether it was Ross, it finally happened. I think uh, Joe Settle mentioned on the pregame show on Blue Jay Central that, uh, yeah, he's like, what took you so long? What, took you so, what yeah. took you so long to move George Springer out of the one hole, to move Danny Jansen hitting in the in the top four in the order? I mean, you have to do it. I, I think hitting David Schneider, Danny, and then Vlad with the way he's been hitting lately, top three, you're, you're giving yourself a much better chance to jump out on teams. And we've seen it. Like, we, we've seen the Blue Jay score the good portion of runs. You know, they, they scored, what, nine today, five yesterday? Four on Sunday ever since this lineup re like realignment. So, so far, the early returns have been all right. I mean, we'll take it. But the, the Jays need to score some runs. And we know that how handicapped this lineup can be in terms of the amount of talent there is there. We can talk about that. But the fact that you, you're you now giving yourself your best chance to actually maximize this lineup, I mean, that's huge. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you mentioned, and just to kind of, I wouldn't say fact check it, but it's like talk about the uh, top guys in the lineup, right? OPSs. Well, David Schneider going to play today. 836. Danny Jansen, which is going to go up from his thing today, just over a thousand, right? And that's going to go up even more with another home run today, a double five RB. He was awesome. And Vladdy, boy, remember we were talking earlier. It's like Vladdy, it's like it, it, his OPS is in the 600s. I mean, it was pretty bad. Now he went one for three with two walks today. It was a 771 OPS going into play today. So it's going to go up even more. So I, I think he's got like a 960 OPS in like the last three weeks. Yeah, he's hitting like I'm, almost four hundred. But yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, four hundred. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? I don't care. I I don't care. Rip mm -hmm. balls at hundred miles an hour. If it ain't, if you ain't, as we've said before, shout out Steve. Uh, if it ain't killing worms, we're doing okay. We'll the ball. His we'll one hit it. today was a solid line drive. Fine by me. Yeah. I'll take it any day of the week. So he's been it's great. A couple and, walks uh, too. And also, I think the biggest X factor with this team right now, Boba Shet, right? He's the one constant that hasn't really moved at all in the line. Him and Vladdy, obviously. Yeah. But Bo, you mentioned you mentioned to me off uh, off the camera saying that Bo didn't have a hit in that Rays series, and I didn't realize how bad yeah. it was. It was pretty oh, bad. Over eleven against the Rays. Yeah. yeah, it's no good. Regardless of what he did before and the hit streak and all, I, who cares, right? Zero for eleven in the series against the divisional opponent uh, is not good enough. Yeah. Um, but today, I know it's the White Sox. Four for four with three doubles. Uh, for a guy in Bobachet who lives off of doubles, like that's his thing. Sure, he like he can hit the home run ball, hit twenty five home runs and stuff like that. But he's a forty double guy. Like he will rip that stuff. And three today, it's a good sight, man. It's a really good sight because going into play today, he had a total of six doubles. <laughs> so he just added the he's already he's put in that net already. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. that's a good sign. And OPS, I don't know, it was what five seventy one going into play today. He had three doubles in a four for four game. It's over six hundred. I was going to say it's got to be over sure six. Now. So some positive vibes flowing. Up the lineup. They avoided the Paul DeYoung revenge game. Oh. That's the important thing. They avoided the Paul DeYoung revenge game. Paul DeYoung, man. Three for four today with a home run, two RBIs, and two runs scored. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Paul DeYoung. Yeah. He, 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 has, he has more home runs now than both Bo and Vlad combined on the season.
Anyway, it's positive. Positive it's stuff. So far, Don Varsho uh, in the seven hole. I mean, look, let's be honest, Rob. Like, yeah. you're a big Varsho guy, but yeah, no, he, he, no it's, not, it's not his. It's not his thing. He, right? He's a career 99 OPS plus guy. He's a, he's a league average hitter. You know what I mean? Like, he's a guy who you, you need to. You can't start him against lefties, and you kind of have to manage when exactly he's going to play. Exactly, like lower in the order for sure. Yeah, no, 100%. In, in, in the 7 8 9 hole, I'm very curious what his splits are when it comes to like hitting in the 7 8 9 hole compared to the like one yeah, through five. Cool. Like, it's probably a, a significant difference. Um, yeah. and he goes back into the seven hole today, right? After hitting in the two hole, I'm assuming like the last little while, and he goes two for four, the home run. Uh, it's great because they have to pitch him, they have to give him pitches to hit because you're in the bottom of the yeah. lineup, you're not going to start pitching around guys. No, it's not going to happen when you're hitting the two hole, they can pitch around you and stuff like that. So or no, they would they would go at you. What am I talking about? Hey, regardless, they could pitch around him, but I don't know. I like his approach at the plate when he's at the bottom line. He doesn't think too much about it. And uh yeah, two for four with a home run. Love to see it. OP, OBP over 300 for Bar Show. There you go, bud. Thank you. That I mean, yeah, he's been like I think uh, OPS in the 740. I think his OPS plus is in like the one ten one teens, one tens. I don't know. Yeah. Regardless, if you're getting that kind of level from Dalton Varsho, I mean you're 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 pretty happy about it. I mean, considering yeah. all that he gives you and the other elements of the game, we know with his glove and with his with his legs. So yeah, it's oh. a we'll take it. If you have him hitting seventh, then yeah, all of a sudden now you feel like that's a pretty deep lineup. Yeah, it definitely is. Now we could talk about the lineup to death because that's just a it's always a black hole for this yeah. team. Um right. But let's get to the stat. I think our overarching I was gonna say our overarching theme is that like regardless of the lineup construction, we acknowledge that despite like how you can shuffle, this is a below average big league lineup. Oh, you know what I mean? Like there's still yeah, it's, a, it's just it's just about maximizing what you can get out of this lineup. That's yeah, all about maximizing. Without a doubt. And shout out Daniel Vogelback. Just an absolute mutant yeah. yesterday. Huge game right. yesterday. Massive. Yeah. Home and then run, play today. Three hits, right. home run, two extra bases. Yeah. And doesn't uh, doesn't doesn't play today with a righty on the mound because they have to get to Justin Turner and let that guy hit, which we are going to go to the Stat Genius page because you have some stuff you want to talk about when it comes to Justin Turner. Yeah, whenever I hear that tune, oh. Rob, I always give like it gives me like France vibes. I don't know. I just I, I feel like I gotta get a baguette in my hand and I'll be a mustache. I, I, anyways, yeah, go on. Yeah, you can rip it up, buddy. Uh Justin Turner. We talked about the laps and their limitations. Uh Justin Turner, it just really sucks. He was such a positive story through April. You look at his April numbers, he was just really, really good for this team. A big reason why they were able to actually be somewhat decent for the first few weeks of the season. Uh, he's gone awry. He's been really bad. And to the point where when they take the field tomorrow, whether or not he'll be in the lineup, I assume he will be, it'll be officially, it'll be officially two calendar weeks. This is the last time he's gotten a hit, a hit, not a home run, not an extra base hit, a base hit, a little dribbler that the third baseman can't get to. You know what I mean? It's a little, little duck snort that falls right in front of the right fielder. I think he's, Oh, for his last 28. I think he's three for his last 49. I think like he has two hits in the month of May total or something like that. It has been egregious. And the fact that, I mean, and, and you know, I, I was a proponent for Justin Turner. I, I, was I? Yeah. Thank God Cole's not here because Cole would like go off. Oh. He, he, he's not a fan of the signing. Uh, you and I were, we, we, not, we, you both, you and I like the idea. We like what he could bring. We did acknowledge though, that there is obviously an, a risk at 39 sure. years old, especially sure. considering for a, a, a guy like him, he's being your everyday DH because he's a guy that, you know, he's not a Brandon Bell type, you know, where he had a 130 career OPS plus. He's, he's a good hitter, but you are likely going to get somewhat of a 105, 115 OPS plus, which is a, a good, not great hitter. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And the fact that you're getting that out of your des designated hitter, uh, that brought some concerns, but you're not even getting league average production. And all of a sudden, now you look at it, well, all of a sudden, why is he a DH? Well, he's a DH because, well, doesn't play defense, doesn't have a lot of speed. So obviously we, we know his age. So all of a sudden it comes to the point where, yeah, it's a one-year deal and he's a veteran. He gets big hits. He's been in the big spots. But can you really afford to keep giving him every day at bats if he's going to struggle like this? Because I'm sorry, 0 for 28, 3 for 49, that, that, that's, that's a little more than a, than a dry spell. That's a little oh. more than a tailspin. That's now a legitimate, I mean – well, not, not, I'm not quite quarter of a season, but like fifth of a season almost sample. Like that's half a hundred at bats. <laughs> that's not nothing. And the fact that you're getting this level of production, it's concerning. 
from your DH spot? Because we talked about we talked so much about this team, how they have guys at AAA who can hit. The only issue is there's just no clear way to get into the lineup because this lineup has DH. They don't have DH days to offer. You can't give uh, Spencer Horowitz a DH day. You yeah. can't give Irrelevance Martinez DH time because you have Justin Turner. You have Vlad Guerrero Jr. who needs a day off his feet. You need George Springer, who you don't want him playing 145 games on uh, in the outfield. And then all of a sudden, your, your major candidates for your DH role, whether that be Springer, but especially Turner, who was signed to be your DH, has been that bad. It, I mean, I feel like at some point you got the wheels got to be spinning a bit, pricey. Wheels no. got to be spinning a bit. What can you do with this? And how do you free up that roster spot? Do you how much do you trust a thirty nine year old that he's just not completely washed? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think oh, that's that's a loaded question. I mean, you, you well, you mentioned th- this is why a, a lot of fans when they overlook April numbers and they're like, "Dude's a monster! Like he's a machine!" And like and you mentioned, yeah. right? Obviously, the the tailspin that he's been on recently. His season totals look awful now. Like, right. he's, remember when he was hitting three, like three ten, had an OPS near a thousand, well nine hundred, watch well all over the place. It was great. He's in two thirty one with a three hundred OBP and a six eighty one OPS now in the season. I mean, this is coming into today. This is coming yeah. into today. Oh, before uh, before yeah. four with a strikeout today. Yeah. So okay. if you look at his, if you look at his batting average and OBP today, after it's two twenty five with a two ninety two on base and a three seventy slug, six sixty two OPS. Man, it's not great. It's not good enough, right? Freaking IKF has an OPS around there. Like <laughs> going into play today, IKF had an OPS of 642. He's in that range, you know. And, and I, like you mentioned, for a DH, that just can't happen. Like you mentioned, I was always on the Justin Turner thing. All the stats showed me everything, and then the April numbers got me even more fired up because it pushed my nerve a bit. But now right. it's hit a wall. And um, and at the same time too, like, like I mentioned, I think the fact that he's 39 years old that's huge because if, yeah. this is, if he's 31, 30, 32, you can at least justify and say, okay, it's an extended slump. But at 39, you at least have to open the possibility to the idea that maybe the sport that doesn't have a lot of guys who are 39 continue to hit well, maybe he's just not a good hitter anymore. We we've opened the door, not even opened the door, we've walked into the room. Of George Springer being that. And obviously it's a little different because George Springer plays like an everyday position. So maybe it makes sense he's dealt with more of an injury history. But uh, all I'm saying is that uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it'd be responsible to just assign this stretch as just a slump. I think that, who knows, maybe at 39 years old, Justin Turner was given this game a lot to offer. Been a really good, great player for many years. Maybe he's just not good anymore. It's yeah. possible. Uh, they're going to give him as much leeway as possible just for what he is and who he is. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. It's, it's That's been a really, it's been a really rough time. And we, you know, the downfall of George Springer really began last year, right? We all yeah. saw it happen last season and those extended slumps, like those happened to him. Like it was like an over for 30 at one point for George last season. Yeah, he had that, like, little dribbler yeah. up the middle single and we're all getting fired up about it. It's just like, <laughs> so that's the kind of stretch we're on right now for Justin Turner. Can he turn it around? It's going to be tough tomorrow with the heart throwing Pierre crochet on the mound for the white Sox, but yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I he, he needs to be productive. I mean, they brought him That's in here opportunity for, for a pun there. That was a good opportunity for a pun right, there. What were we going to use? What were we going to use? Oh, 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 oh. Can, he turn, can he turn it around? <laughs> well, I, hopefully Anyways. he does turn it around. But, uh, Rob, let's go to the farm. Because you mentioned how the the guys in, the, in Buffalo were doing well, but it's a log jam at the big league level. Well, let's touch on them, and uh, it's not much going on down there in positive land. So we'll touch on all that stuff on the farm. So let's start right with the positive because it's got to be something. Um, the Buffalo Bisons, I mean, they have been a hitting machine at the AAA level, and Jays fans pull their hair out when they hear that because they're like, and we freaking stink at the big league level. And we're watching these guys absolutely tear apart Triple A Buffalo, and yeah, it's because of that logjam of Kevin Biggio, Ernie Clement, and I guess in this case Justin Turner as well at the big league level, who aren't hitting very well. But you don't want to lose them for squat, so you're like, well, what do we do? We just hold on to them. And the Bisons, I'm just going to read off some OPSs here. Okay, uh, Spencer Horowitz, 9.23. Nathan Lucas is hitting 3.50 with a 9.51 OPS. Uh, Addison Barger really getting hot recently, hitting uh, 280 with a 959 OPS. Even, you know, Relvis has been really struggling recently. I mean, really, really struggling. Uh, he's hitting now 256 with an 813 OPS. Remember, you're we talking up near 1,000. Again, yeah. the early season stuff. 
He's hitting eight ter- but even an 813 OPS isn't terrible. Or that's sorry, 819, whatever. Uh Eloy Jimenez, Jimenez. Leo Jimenez. Eloy Jimenez. Eloy Jimenez. He's he's a guy with no power, but he's got an OPS of 813. He's walking an absolute crap ton. He's got like an OBP of over 400. He's been great for them. Will Robertson's hitting moonshots left and right. He has an 850, 868 OPS. And even in the number nine hole, Stuart Baroa, who is a speed demon, he's hitting 311 with an 877 OPS. That's tons of guys who are doing very well, but nowhere to play uh, here at the big league level with the Toronto Blue Jays, unfortunately. Now we'll go to the brief top prospects, and yeah, it's not great. Like we just talked about Aralvis Martinez, that's your number two. And your number one, and Ricky Tiedemann, still doesn't throw a baseball. Brandon yeah. Barriera, we obviously know Tommy John. Arjun Namala, hasn't had a good start to the year, and he hasn't played in eight days. Not sure what's going on there. Talked about Is there an injury going on there? I didn't. doesn't yeah. say on here, but he might be. Leo Menes is doing great. Barge is doing great. Alan Roden's been kind of mad. He's got an OPS in like the, was it 740, 739. It's fine uh, in double A, but it's your top 10 prospects. Not really what you want. My buddy, my boy, Manuel Bonilla has really fallen off the last little bit here. He's got a 741 OPS all of a sudden. So now things aren't great in the minor leagues. Yeah. But the Buffalo Bisons have a ton of guys that can play in the big league level or just give them an opportunity, but they don't have a spot. Rob, what are your, what are your thoughts on the whole Buffalo situation? I know you guys, you, Rob, or what? You, Cole, and Mo <laughs> have been down in Buffalo a couple times to talk to some of these players. And you always talk to Aaron Sanchez. If people haven't yeah. checked the interview already, go check that out. I believe it's on this podcast page. It's, yeah. I believe, on the, the Blue Jay Center Instagram page as well. Wherever you want to look at it, go for it. It's a great interview with Rob. Um, what's the vibe like down in AAA? I, I, it's just like they're all ripping baseballs, but there's no spot up to the big leagues. So what, what's the vibe? Yeah. Honestly, the, the vibe is just really refreshing considering like what it is up here at the big league level. You go there in Buffalo and like, I mean, obviously we, we talk to the players there, but just like the people around them, they, they like this team. They think they're a lot of fun to, team to watch. There's a really yeah. good group of guys. They're playing really well. Uh, I'm not sure what their record is. I think there were like six, seven games over 500 last mm-hmm. when I was there last weekend. I'm not sure how they've done over the course of this past week. 25 and 20. That real quick. 25 and 20. Okay, so we're right around that pace. Uh, also, Chad Green pitched a rehab assignment. Uh, yeah, there the other day, a lot of hit. Oh, yeah. yes, great. Sorry, good. clean. Yeah, a lot that, of hit. That was right good. Yeah. yeah, but no, it, it seems like the team is playing well. They're hitting a lot of balls. Uh, the, the the vibes seem pretty good up in Buffalo. Completely different from where it is up here. And like to me, I I don't think it's necessarily like the obviously the players there they understand that they have to go out there and play their hardest. You know, I'm, I haven't been around the team quite enough to just get the. Also, any frustration of whether they're going to the big leagues or not. Obviously, we saw Addison Barger get called up uh, not too long ago. Uh, I think it's just more the, the, the roster construction of this team. And you look at, I mean, they've been so, they, they've done such a poor job, Ross Atkins and the Blue Jays organization has at just developing like pitching depth at any like level to the point where your whole rotation, we mentioned how good they've been. Yes, they've hit a lot of free agency signings, but yeah. Now all of a sudden you have so many guys with committed money that you just you can't afford to have depth at, at the AAA spot. You know what I mean? You have so many guys. So there's no roster spots to come up and take unless an injury happens. At the same time, uh, on the offensive side of the ball, the fact that you have so many guys, like you mentioned, reading off those OPSs, so many guys that appear to be like I, I think Spencer Horowitz and Elvis Martinez, they both look like major league caliber hitters today. The only issue is you don't have roster spots for them because, God forbid, the lineup that's 29th in baseball and runs scored cut some guys and free up some room for these guys. Uh, to me, I, I feel like Buffalo is going to be a really interesting scenario to monitor in terms of if the Blue Jays decide to pivot and sell because that will yeah. open roster spots. But if you're, the Jays are trying to win, it does appear as though there's definitely a logjam there. I and mean, they're just not sure who's going to get chances to play. I think uh, Addison Barger would be the, the guy that gets a look because he's a guy who can play all over the field, whereas – Spencer Horowitz, he's essentially uh, a DH slash first baseman. I know he can play corner outfield a bit, but I mean, that's obviously not ideal. Um, and then Arelvis Martinez, as good as he's been, there are some concerns with uh, how his game will translate to the big league level. Uh, I think especially his swing and miss rate. Uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's definitely a lot of holes in that bat still. Obviously, the power is very legit, which for this team, considering how little power they have, is very intriguing. I do think he gets a look at some point this season, definitely. I'm not sure when that's going to be. Yeah. Uh, but to me, watching the Bisons and the Blue Jays as extensively as I have, it's obvious that 
the roster construction, the bridge between the, the two affiliates, there's just not, there's, there's no alignment there. It's just a really poor roster construction. And you're not really getting positive benefits from either one. You're not really getting good results at the big league yeah. level. And your good hitters in AAA, your young guys, they're, they're stuck there. And I think that's, that's, that's a bad recipe. It yeah. really is. It really is. It really is. It's a weird kind of spot this team and this franchise is uh, right now with the way their minor leagues are hitting pretty well. Mm -hmm. I don't want to lose any guy at the big I'll go, leagues. I'll take a, a deeper dive actually into this. This is kind of more sure. of a philosophical issue with this organization. But I think the fact that this lineup has gone to this point where it is, which is basically you know that they made a decision to scale back on the offense after the 2022 offseason. They yeah. decided – we're gonna go. We're gonna be pitching a defense team because we think we have enough <laughs> in, the, in the offense. And I, I would argue a big reason why they did that is because, well, we can't develop any good arms at the AAA level, so we have to go out and buy them inefficiently. We have to go out there and spend. Uh, they, they've given out the four guys that are pitching that are on multi-year deals. You know, what I mean, Kevin Gosman, Chris Bassett, regardless, Jose Barrios, and to the point where you just can't afford to allocate any more asset capital into your lineup. So that's why they've had to bank on Vlad. They've had to basically put him around a bare bone lineup and say, here, mm -hmm. carry this lineup. And unfortunately uh, we, we've gotten to come out that Vlad's not the 900 OPS plus guy. He's more of a just yeah. really good hitter. He's not the, he's not Yohan Soto. He's not Ronald Acuna. You know, he's not Tatis. We've gotten to, that's a harsh reality. And I, I think to me, a big reason why it's come to that point where we've had to realize that and see it firsthand is because the, just their inability to actually develop a well-rounded roster where they actually have to go out and spend resources. And when you spend resources, you got to cut from other places. And it's crazy. Like if you really deep dive into this, yeah. other than Alec Manoa, who again, was a first round pick. Not one guy. And Sorry. You, not one guy. Not one guy who's given you like. Boba a, second, a second round pick. No, I, Alec pitching, wise, pick. pitching wise. Pitching wise. No, I'm not. I'm talking. Bro, I'm going general, buddy. I'm going full okay, on general. Okay. Like got other than Boa's a second round pick and Bo is a yeah. or uh, Manoa is a pitcher, they've they haven't developed anything, and even all the got even all their top prospects they've traded away have never turned out to be anything. So it tells you. Right, but I will push back. They did get major league talent for those top prospects. Oh no, I'm not, saying they, Rios, well, I'm not yeah. saying they didn't. But there's a reason that none of these guys developed into anything of substance. Yeah, Jordan Groshans, yeah. Austin Martin, guys like that. Those were top prospects. That never panned out. And it's right. like, there's a reason as to why all your prospects, everyone, Jays fans like, whoa, you know, we trade these guys away, all these guys for Matt Chapman, and none of them, none of them have been any good. It's the reason for that. <laughs> or maybe just not good. Huh? So it's just like the whole prospect system, you're one of the worst farm systems in baseball, plus all these other guys you've traded away haven't been any good. Like, you're not developing at all from within. Right. So right. it's it's other than Manoa and Boba Shet, these guys haven't developed anybody. Yeah. And no, you're right. You're people right. are gonna say, Well, David Schneider. Oh, you mean the guy that they probably picked off what off of uh Walgreens or something? Like, like Ooh, they, they, they didn't even like they, they, they were forced to play him basically because yeah. they, 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 they look <laughs> they for any excuse to bench him whenever he had a bad game. Oh, you yeah. can't have the high fastball, I gotta get IKF spat in there. So other than a 26th round pick, Bo Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero Jr., or, uh, and, 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 and Alec Manoa, you haven't developed a damn thing. No. So even there, Nate Pearson, the can't miss guy, that hasn't gone well either. So it's just it's something to think about moving forward when we, when we were talking about Ross Atkins taking that next step with the future of this oh, team. So Also, I, I do I do apologize for hijacking this combo. We were talking about the, the AAA team. I just go into a full-on philosophical issue on how bad this front office is. Yeah, I don't, know how, that, I don't know how that got there, but we just uh, did. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that, that's that's what natural combo is. It leads you to leads you to different places. It is. Now, let's move our conversation to this final topic of the day, yeah. and it's this upcoming stretch in May, and they've obviously started that with today's win um, against the White Sox. They have thirteen games, or I guess technically not thirteen, but they have a thirteen game oh, no. stretch yeah. um, of teams that you should beat the crap out of if you are a playoff team. Now that doesn't mean a damn thing. Like I, I, this is the part where I'm trying to. I want to get your take on this, Rob, because you got obviously White Sox for three at home. You go to Detroit for four. You have the White Sox in Chicago for three. Then you have the Pirates at home for three. Like this is a stretch where if you're going to try and build this team back to 500 and beyond, you right. got to take advantage. Now they did that today, which was awesome, but it's one yeah. game. So right. let's say the Jays go 
they, they, would, they would have to go nine and four to be 500. I did the math. Okay. So let's say they go nine and four. Okay. Hold on a minute. Uh, uh, 10, uh, nine and four. So 10, 10 and three. Let's say they go 10 and three. And they're what? Two games above would that be? One game above? Two games above 500. Yes. Two, two above games above out of this stretch, which is 10 and three yeah. is good, right? It's a good stretch. But you're two right. games over 500 in the American League East after this big stretch. Now you do have Baltimore for four. At home, I think afterwards, and then you have Oakland in Oakland for three. So it's like another little yeah. easy schedule there for that. But um, what, let's say they go ten and three. How do you feel? Yeah. Well, at that point, what you'd be yeah, you said two games over five hundred. I assume you'd probably be either maybe not in a playoff spot, but either half a game, a game maybe out of a playoff spot. So you'd be right there. You'd be right there playing some good baseball, playing hot baseball. Yeah. Uh, and and this is the the issue I alluded to earlier that. Regardless of what happens, they're just we have two months until we actually have to make a, a, a concrete decision on this team. Well, not us, but like they have to make what concrete. So yeah. it's really the boring answer, but it would depend on what happens then. You know, beating a bunch of crappy teams, it's great. You have to. Look, look, you gotta play what's on your schedule. If you can beat the bad teams, that that's how good teams are good in baseball, you know. Yeah. There's a reason why, you know, the best teams win 55% of their games. You know, yeah. that's not a lot. It, it doesn't seem like a lot on paper. But it's I think what just do the math right now. What would like uh, a fifty-five win percentage be? I'd assume it's like it's definitely well over five hundred. But regardless, we don't, we yeah, don't do the math the be, right now. Nine. I don't think it would be ninety. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it would be ninety. Fifty-five point five percent of your winning percentage would be ninety wins. There you so, go. In, in the foundation of that ninety wins, it's being decent against good teams and beating the crap out of bad teams. That's what you're supposed to do. That's how it is. You know, you, you can't just beat up on all the good teams. You know, it comes with being right. the bad teams as well. So you'd feel good about the Blue Jays for taking care of business. However, you would need to then see how they do against the better teams. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we, and, Ross and, Atkins actually asked about uh, about how this team's performed so far. And he basically, because they've had a tough schedule. You know, I think Shai Davidi mentioned they have one of the toughest schedules in all of baseball to this point. And Ross Atkins was talking about their performance against the good team, saying that, oh, we're not playing our best baseball. So that's, you know, take it easy on us, which is kind of ridiculous because it's like, well, this is a, this, they're probably correlated. You're, you're not playing your best baseball because you're not as good as these teams. But anyways, that's uh, yeah, a long-winded way of saying it, it wouldn't really change my opinion all that much. I think that it would make me feel better about uh, their chances of turning it around. But ultimately, you would need to see some concrete proof of concept that, they can actually do it against the, the the good teams, and I don't mean like do great against the good teams. I don't mean like have a six hundred winning percentage against the good teams, but just yeah. can can you be somewhat competent? Which they haven't been. They, they they've been bad against the good teams and the good pitching. Yeah, it's true. You, and and, I, and the one thing I wanted to bring up is that I know we're talking about the previewing the rest of the May, and we just we kind of just didn't how they need to go like ten and three. But I quickly scrolled through yeah. June. It's a bloodbath. After that Oakland series, after the four gamer against uh, Baltimore, yeah. which is the series right after this. May this 13 game stretch. You got Milwaukee in Milwaukee for three. You have Guardians for three, Red Sox three, Guardians three, Red Sox three, Yankees four, Astros four, Mariners three. That goes into the beginning of July. Like that is a bloodbath. <laughs> That's a bloodbath. Yeah. No, there, there will be no hiding. If this is a fraudulent team, then there'll be no hiding. They, they will, they will. <laughs> They'll, they'll, they'll meet their maker in June. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. Let me ask you this though: Have you reached the point of no return to the point where even if the Blue Jays were to have a ten and three stretch, and you're thinking, "Huh, maybe it's not the best idea that they get fooled into this team," so they they not like you, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, you were right. they might get fooled into thinking this team's better than it actually is by going into this stretch and then not making the right decision to scale back at the deadline. If you're there yet, I'm not there yet personally. I still feel like. As bad as it's been, I still want to collect a little bit more data before I completely pull the plug on this season. But I want to know your thoughts. Are you, are you at the point of no return? <laughs> you and I, after that, after the Rays game where they blew a 4 nothing lead, I was done. But I was like, yeah, just get rid of everybody. I'm kind of tired. Now, of he, a little heat of the moment, but yes. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm um, definitely trending there. I am definitely trending there. Let me tell you that. Well, I don't want false hope. Right, I don't want them to beat the crap out of bad teams, go 10-3 and three, like we said, and be a couple of games above five hundred. And then, Which, kind by of, the way, you know, let me just say ten and three. That's very difficult to do. It's going to be sure, very they're, hard. They're one one it's now nine and three, but that's that's yeah. still very tough to do it's for very a team offensively. We're, we're talking about like ah, oh, they yes. just go ten and three. Like no, it's going to be very hard for them to go ten and three. The one thing is, they have the horseshoe ram so far up their butt going into this third team game. You're not somehow in a four game series against Detroit. You're not seeing Tariq Skubal. You're Tarek Skubal. You're not seeing him. But, 
but but I'm going to the game though, so that that might offset. Yeah, Rob, we're, we're going to be at the two games, buddy. I mean, I understand there's that voodoo crap with it, but regardless, uh, you get the Pirates. You're missing Paul Skeens. You're missing Jared Jones. Like somehow this is happening. This is your chance. You can if you go ten and three, it's fine, but you're missing everyone's ace. <laughs> yeah, try to find a way. And um, it, again, even yes, I, I'm even if they go ten and three, I'm not fully buying it. I, I just can't. I've seen this too much where you beat up on the crap teams. Rob, we've watched enough baseball back in 2021. The the, the fraudulent White Sox, right? They oh. they they were horrific against all the good teams. Or was that 2022? 2021. Yeah, it was 21. Sox. Yeah, got, yeah. I, I, I remember because I, I predicted them to go to win the to go to the World Series that year. Oof, that didn't happen. Yeah, wow. Well. We all know their record against good teams and then the record against bad teams. It was so fluctuated, and they got in the playoffs and didn't. Did, God, they were out class like crazy, and and. For the Jays, I don't want them to get any false hope. I don't want them to beat the crap out of these bad teams and then fall apart, to be honest with you. I, I, again, I'm not at the point where even if they go 10-3, and three, I'm still like trade everybody off. Um, but seeing what this team is, seeing what this franchise is and the future of the organization, I mean, we've talked about it at nauseum about the, this two-year window that we have sitting here. I guess now a year and a, almost a year and a half window that we got sitting here. Of, of controllability of your more, more, most of your young players and your expiring contracts and guys like Kevin Gosman. So yeah, I don't, I, I I'm still in the pivot mode where I'd, I'd like, I, cause I want them to win a world series. Like I don't yeah. want them to get in and get their ass kicked in the, in, in, in the postseason. Like, I'd rather not watch that again. Um, right. However, postseason games, postseason games, they're fun to watch. So yeah. well, no, I, I I do, but I, I think that we, we can have an honest conversation that based on all the data we've collected, like we know that this team has currently constructed. No. This is not like this is not a team that's going to make a deep playoff. No, run. you know, like this is it just it's not what it is. You know, like a, a playoff spot. Like I, I find it very interesting how fans are just so dismissal of a playoff spot where they're just like, even if they make the playoffs, they're just going to get killed. Like the idea that this team is like that far away from a playoff spot, like that close, like, oh, even if they are a playoff team, they're not close to a playoff team right now, man. Like yeah. if you look at what we've seen so far on th in this sample, like they have to play so, so much better. I'll tell you one thing, this may be controversial. That team last year that we all didn't like to watch, that team was way closer to a World Series team. Oh, this team is closer yeah. to a playoff team. Yeah, yeah no doubt. And so it's like, the, 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 but what I'm trying to say is that I, I reject that notion that like, oh, I, I don't want like, you know, they make the playoffs look get killed anyway. Like a lot will have to go right at this from this point on for this team to even get back to that point. So if we're talking about that, and then we'll we'll be in good shape because that would mean that they've had to rip off a ton of wins in a row now. Yeah, I mean, there's no off days coming up, so you go straight through. No off days until June, I believe. Right? Is that what it is? Let me let me quickly. Let me I, believe, quickly I, I don't I don't think they have an off day until June. I think like that middle be, of June too, if I'm not mistaken. Oh my, okay, let me let me, let me get to that because that's that sounds like. Yeah. A, I mean, they have had a lot of off days recently, so that would make a lot of right. sense. So they play on the twentieth, twenty first, twenty second. Getting holy getting crap! Yeah, you weren't kidding. Me. Uh, the thirteenth of June looks like the right. the one off day where they come back from Milwaukee. Whoa, whoa. a lot of days in a row, a lot of games in a row. But this is the thing: you get hot. You can ride that wave daily. So this is an interesting yeah. thing. Obviously, the White Sox series continues tomorrow. Garrett Crochet versus Yusei Kikuchi. A lot of people will be listening to this, I don't know, tomorrow or something. So they might already know the result uh, of tomorrow night's game. But regardless, we'll be back talking on Thursday. And that will be the end of the White Sox series. And uh, I guess heading into, we'll probably be recording it during the first game of that Tiger series. So as for myself, James Price, Rob, and the two fellows behind the glass screen, whatever, Shane and Tra hey, well, Jimmy's getting trained today. And thanks to those guys, as always, for their support during the, during the, during the show and all the tags down the bottom. Love them always. And uh, we'll talk to you guys on Thursday. Yo, Jay. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast Blue Jay Center on YouTube, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.